If someone were to say to you, why what happened all those years ago had to have happened to you, how would you respond? Because it was necessary. And do you have any regrets? I haven't done enough to please my mother. Which mother? This is Criteria. Hey everybody, uh, welcome to another episode of Criteria. Today we're here to discuss a film that's not on the Vatican film list, as we'll be doing from time to time, uh, a contemporary film that just came out. Um, If you're hearing this, the movie is now available to watch on video on demand online and in select theaters, uh, Fatima. Yeah, so we're just going to be giving you our, our first impressions here. Um, nothing fancy. Uh, normally we, you know, watch a movie a couple times and have some time to think about it before we record a discussion. But in this case, we're just kind of doing it off the cuff here. So uh, I'm here. Uh, I'm Thomas, of course, and uh, here with James Mayevsky, as always. Hey, James. Hey, Thomas. Yes. Yeah. We, so we, we literally just watched this movie, only finishing it just a few minutes ago. And, uh, we have some first impressions, so I don't know. What do you want to go first, Thomas? Or well, um, I think I can speak for both of us. The Fatima is very important That's uh, right. to us. Yeah. Um, I, however, am not really, I would say, all that knowledgeable about the history of Fatima. Yeah, me um, neither. Obviously, I, I learned the, the story as a kid, um, and I know the basic message. Um, not, not too many of the details in the film uh, were surprising to me. Um, but I, I'm more familiar with just kind of like say the rosary every day, you know, do the first five sat- five first Saturdays devotion for reparation for sins against the Immaculate Heart and a couple of the other things that Mary said. But I haven't studied the kind of like each individual apparition th- that closely or uh, anything like that. Right. Um, same here. I literally I just want to know what am I supposed to do? So Right. Right. Say the rosary every yeah. day. There, there's some prayers that Our Lady gave to... Yeah, the Fatima prayer right. that we say at the end of each decade of the rosary, typically. Yeah, but but going deeper into the story or into the figures of Lucia or Francisco, Jacinta, um, or, or the particular visions themselves, uh, yeah, I'm not super familiar with any and, of that. Yeah, and that's something, of course, I'm sure we'll, we'll study as time goes on. Yeah, I've got a couple more, of books. Learn more about... I actually, if, again, Fatima is very important to me, and I, I actually have an article that I've been planning to write about the importance of Fatima. Yeah, so, so we're we're happy to see, uh, you know, a high profile film released on this topic, um, and you know, at the very least, it'll hopefully be uh, an adequate introduction to the topic, right? I guess what what's uh, in a general way, you know, one of the things that strikes me about the film is that. You know, the bulk of it is not spent on like the visions. The bulk of it is spent on dealing with kind of the the trouble that uh, is stirred up in the life of Lucia in particular as a result of being this, you know, chosen girl to, mm-hmm. to have these visions, uh, both with the kind of, I guess, like liberal Freemasonic government and uh, her own family and the fellow vi- villagers and things like that, which is an understandable choice. <laughs> You know, as far as drawing people into the story, and uh, obviously there's there's insights that can be mined there. I think that's that's the stuff that I know the least about. So I'm not really prepared to say like you know how much of it is historical to do with like how her parents responded to it and stuff like that. The stuff with the uh, the stuff with the how the government responded to it is is quite accurate based on what I know. You know, uh, for example, a lot of, a big part of the film from the very beginning is. That she has a brother, Manuel, who's fighting in World War One, and they're very concerned about whether he's going to make it back home alive. Um, and this ties in with kind of like the spiritual drama of the film. And as far as I can tell, this is just totally an invention. Uh, Manuel is uh, – at least I couldn't find any information about this supposed brother by Googling him or anything like that. So – I don't know what the deal with deal with is that, but of course, you know, it's kind of the nature of a fictionalized presentation that they're going to um, add things. Yeah, I think that what I was struck by uh, on watching this was just how relevant the Fatima message still is. There's so much in the film that's touched on, whether it's war, praying for peace. I think that's particularly, it's always necessary, but I think 
the need for that is particularly obvious right now. Re- there's reference in the film to the Spanish influenza, you know, which is what killed uh, Saints Jacinto, Jacinta and Francesco. Right. Um, so here just we a are a little bit after the film's events. Right. So here we are in our own pandemic. Um, the liberal progressive governments overstepping, shutting down of churches. Right. And, uh, that was something that that takes place in the film. That obviously echoed so much of what we've been dealing with right now in the United States and elsewhere. You know, for me, it felt like a fresh call to answer Our Lady's request that we pray the rosary every day and that we pray for peace and that we embrace suffering. Right. You know, that was another thing that kind of- Yeah, that was the biggest one because it's the one that I probably do least. Right, You know, I do the rosary every day. I do the first Saturdays, which are not mentioned in the film, but- it's part of it, uh, but yeah, the this you know the, the sac- making sacrifices is like the probably the missing uh, missing link there, right? Um, yeah, and 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 so there's an interesting sort of meta narrative going on in this film as it's showing us via flashback the events surrounding the apparitions. There's also a character played by Harvey Keitel. He's sort of a skeptical academic writing a book on the subject. And he's inter- interviewing Sister Lucia later in life. So it sort of cuts back and forth between the flashbacks and these scenes with Harvey Keitel's character and right. an older Sister Lucia. One of the questions that he asks her is, you know, how could God ask children to suffer? Right. Um, and, and honestly, he has a lot of good questions throughout the yeah. film. Yeah. Um, but that was one that kind of landed with me like, dang, yeah, I'm. He asks these children to suffer. Our our mother, our blessed mother, asks these children to suffer for sinners. Yeah, um, and of course, God asks His Son, our Lord, the only innocent one. Yeah, the only innocent one to suffer. This is, you know, a, a subject for meditation. Yeah, yeah, you know, uh, and that would be like you know one of the biggest kind of kind of points of of conflict with the world, right? You know, mm-hmm. uh, that they can't accept. <laughs> uh, I, I love these, uh, these scenes, these, these, uh, contemporary, more or less present day scenes, not quite present day because Sister Lucia died a few years ago. Mm-hmm. But to me, they were some of the most effective scenes in the film. And, and, you know, I've seen films, I can't think of a specific example, but I've seen films with this kind of framing device before. And sometimes it feels redundant or just like, it's fine, but like there's not much meat there. Mm-hmm. But I actually thought these were really effective. I thought they were both acted really well. I, I I felt like I really benefited from seeing this portrayal of Sister Lucia as like a mature adult, yeah. you know, as an elderly woman. Yes. Um, you know, not having given that much thought to that stage of her her life. Because, you know, so much of what I, I haven't read, the, the interviews with her or anything. So, mostly, honestly, mostly the things that I've heard about Sister Lucia in her older years are people, like, proof texting her in, like, various debates mm-hmm. about Fatima. Mm-hmm. Um, and, like, well, she said this and blah, 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 you know. Uh, so, getting to see her, like, her personality and her kind of, like, intelligence uh, and maturity uh, was, was really nice. I, I thought that was really well done. And as you said... I thought that, um, you know, he act, asked a lot of good questions, questions that all Catholics as well as like, you know, people who are like on the fence about either kind of faith in general or this uh, event in particular would, would probably do well to ponder and like be challenged by. I thought that was highly effective yeah. and really um, in addition to what you were saying about the kind of like contemporary resonance of some of the other aspects of the time period Mm -hmm. um, really helps to bring, make the film relevant to us. Yeah. One thing I also really appreciated was the instances where, where the film depicts ascetic practices specifically performed by Lucia as a child. There's one scene in particular where she's praying the rosary on her knees, moving in circles on her knees into the night. And, yeah, you know, it just sort of coupled with that overall message of penance for insults and blasphemies to our Lord and to the Immaculate Heart. That was something that I was happy to see shown in this film because I think too often, even in 
films, beloved, much beloved films about saints, we don't see that side of things. Right. Um, we, we, earlier in this podcast, we talked about uh, A Man for All Seasons. That comes to mind as an example of a movie about an incredible saint, an incredible period in time, but we don't see his his asceticism really right. on yeah, display. Right, we talked about that. Yeah. But, you know, I think post, post-Vatican post II, this is something I think of a lot, is like you don't hear a lot about making reparations. Right. For, even for your own sins, let alone like That's right. other people's sins. That's right. Um, and, and I make so many excuses to myself yeah. for the slightest – discomfort in prayer. You know, I mean, how many times I make excuses to myself to, you know, not kneel or, or, or whatever, what have you. I think that, uh, that watching this film helped to disrupt that complacency a little bit for myself, which of course I think is really what the Fatima message is about. Yeah. Disrupting a certain complacency that I think is still prevailing in the church, which yeah. is the most scandalous, to say nothing of the rest of the world. I, I remember, um, you know, on this topic, I remember reading a quote. I was learning about the Sacred Heart Devotion, and there was a quote from some past pope, I forget who, where he said something like, the two chief duties of the Christian religion are, I can't remember his exact words, but I, uh, one of them was reparation. I think he said worship and reparation. Mm-hmm. And gosh, I thought, you know, well, if that's one of the two chief duties of the Christian religion, then like, gosh, I never hear about that even from my Orthodox Catholic priests in, yeah. in sermons. It's just it's just not talked about. Right. And I think I think part of the reason is maybe that it's seen as like a, a dark thing or like, mm-hmm. you know, if you're th- focusing on making reparation for your past sins, then you're still like living in the past. You're still like – yeah you know, you're still not free mm-hmm. or like you haven't like let go of them or whatever. And it's, that's not like what it's about. Right. Um, so I think, I think now we want to just have the like good feeling of like going to confession and that's done with, and now I don't have to think about it anymore. That's right. Uh, but it's like, you know, when we do harm in, in, the, in the visible world around us, we don't just apologize and confess it. We all, and try to be better. We also, make reparation yeah you know so it's the same with right you know wounds to jesus and mary mm-hmm. um, and it's not just reparation for ourselves that mary calls for it's reparation for other on on, right. on behalf of others right which i think is you know ultimately that's done perfectly and completely by christ right but what good is the catholic church what good are catholics what good are christians if we're not following Jesus in this way and doing this on behalf of others. Yeah. You, you know, I you mentioned like this sort of aversion to emphases that might appear to be overly dark and I think that that is a way that a lot of religious films sometimes suffer mm-hmm. um is by sort of being overly sanguine or yeah. or sugar-coated nice nice feelings. Another thing about this film that I thought was remarkable is is that it's intense at times. Yeah. Um, you know, our blessed mother showed a vision of hell yeah. to the three children. And the, followed by a vision of a war in which, you know, the Pope and bishops are shot to death. Right. And and, yeah. and so we see that that vision um uh presented in the film right. and it's it's not overdone. I feel like it's very tastefully handled, yeah, but it's so. not – no punches are pulled. You know, it's definitely very intense. Yeah. Um, you know, so that that was that was another thing that the film has got me thinking about is not just the call for reparation, for penance, and for prayer, but also the the consequences of, of not fulfilling this responsibility. Right. The, the precise things that we are praying to avert – Right. Uh, war in the world, persecution of the church, and ultimately losing souls. You know, there's an urgency behind the Fatima message, and I, I think that urgency comes across in the film. Right. And I think that for me personally, that's something that I'm taking away. That's what I hope that a lot of people seeing this right. this movie might might walk away with. Right. Yeah. I thought that the sequence, that vision in particular – the vision of hell followed by the vision of possible future was with the frame parts, the most, the most effective part of the film in in terms of like what will stay with me, you know, with a film like this, I'm never sure of my like objectivity 
in in judging it as a film yeah uh, as a presentation of like the material i can kind of like evaluate it more but when i already know the story it's like you know not just with religious films when i was watching like the tolkien biopic you know it's something of the same experience you're like evaluating the information they're presenting as well right, and all right. this and and you also already have a personal connection to the material so mm-hmm. like it's hard to like tell how effective this would be to someone who doesn't like what am i tearing up about am i like tearing up because of this film or because like something that this film made me think about right. that I already have a connection with, but the film didn't like make the connection happen or, you know, I, the film is very competently done. It's very watchable. It's, I, I think it's a really good presentation of the material throughout, but you know, sometimes a question I ask with films of this sort is like, how much will the, is the film itself like going to stand the test of time sure. or like how like cinematically striking is this and it, like what does this add to like if i was just reading a book about fatima mm-hmm. um obviously for many people it, they can connect on a more popular level or an, uh, easier with the movie so for me just with all that in mind for me the stuff that i found like most uh striking and memorable were were those sequences mm-hmm. i do have a question though about the hell sequence i thought it was well done as you say i couldn't help but wondering with a see any sequence that shows especially something that's like just so beyond our imagination, like heaven or hell, would it be more effective if they just showed the characters' reactions? Yeah, well, this is this is a, a good question because it's certainly true of this depiction of hell, but I also think it's a question worth asking about the depiction of Mary yes, in the film. Yes, so yes. Uh, so at first the, first, the first sort of uh, miraculous thing we see in the film is the angel of peace, the angel of, of Portugal, you know the angels played by an actress, and she, you know, we see her face, and right. uh, and I, I found myself kind of disappointed about that, thinking, ah, oh, man, well, you know, if this had been left up to my imagination, it would be more miraculous, you know, like you say, Thomas, there are certain things that sort of uh, escape. They go so far beyond our imagination, anyway. Yeah, it's like uh, a risk to portray them, but I found that with the Blessed Mother. I actually didn't find myself needing to suspend disbelief too much or to no. get past no. anything in seeing this portrayal of her uh, played by this this uh, very beautiful actress. For me, it really concretized the reality of these apparitions, that these children saw a woman. Yeah. And... And we're watching this film and we see a woman. Yeah. I think it's it's entirely appropriate for them to show her and to show her face, both uh, for the reasons you say, and for her maternal role, for her consoling role. And also, she is a human being. That's right. She is a mere mortal. That's right. Um, I know that, uh, you know, earlier films about Jesus, especially under like the, the Catholic Legion of Decency and stuff were... Very careful about how they showed Christ. Some of them didn't show his face, you mm-hmm. know. Now, you can debate about that. Christ is Christ became man and showed himself to us. Right. So, it's not wrong to depict him. But it seems even more appropriate in this case, I right. think. Right, right. Yeah, there was one shot where it cuts from Lucia looking at the Blessed Mother and then the camera pans and Lucia is looking at her own mother. The maternity of Mary is made more is jumps out more because whether this is actually how it happened historically or not, her mother is not very nice to her. Mm-hmm. Uh, we we start out her mother seems like a pious woman, but right away I got some like an off vibe because at the beginning she's like offering to God to make all these sacrifices and prayers and have her whole family do it so that her son will come home safely from the war. And I just sensed a sense of like she wants to like control this yeah. outcome, right? Uh, you know, I don't know. Maybe it's an injustice to her mother, but I think it does it does make the comparison with Mary stepping in to Lucia's life mm-hmm. at this point. And you'll notice that we're talking about Lucia a lot because Jacinta and Francisco are pretty much like on the sideline in this yeah. film for the most part. Uh, also, again, regardless of the historical reality of it, I think that if the only conflict for Lucia had been with the government, I think that would have felt a little thin. Yes. I think that it would have felt a little more like a uh 
you know, the old story about the the uh, college professor who's an atheist, and, <laughs> you know, all that stuff. Um, but I think that for her to deal with opposition from her own family and different levels of trust and things like that, mm-hmm. and, I don't know. I think it. I think but that's the primary way, not so much the conflict with the government that we see her suffer in the film. So it's kind of important because Our Lady even tells her stop tying ropes around your waist for penance, just like embrace your suffering. Yeah. Uh, and, and so that's her suffering. Uh, the, the various things that seem to be going wrong in her family and community that she feels are almost because of her, because this is happening to her, mm-hmm. you know, all this tension and conflict. Um, the, the film does deal well with the persecution from the government. It's not kind of like overly cartoonish or anything. One article I read, uh, I, I remember learning about this as a kid that the, the mayor of the town, who's like a hardcore, like liberal atheist, he threat he actually in real life threatened to boil the children in oil. He like threatened to execute them. Now, like whether that's just like a scare tactic for children is like, sure. obviously in the movie, they did leave that part out, but he does put the, he does kind of intimidate them to a certain degree. He does have the church closed. Uh, he does try to Im- intimidate the parents and the, the church the, the clergymen and, uh, and he jails Lucia temporarily, although in, in real life, again, it was all three of them were put into prison together. But this film just focuses more on her perspective. Mm-hmm. So were there any performances that stood out to you? You know, I really liked uh, I, I thought Sonia Braga as the elderly sister Lucia was really great. And um, I liked Harvey Keitel's performance. He's not an actor. I know he's like famous, but he's not an actor that I'm that familiar with, at least by name. Other performances, you know, um, the mayor was really good, I thought. Everybody was good. Jacinta was one of my favorites. Yes, she was she, great. Yeah, was the really child great. who plays her just plays her with such sincerity and yeah. such, uh, you know, childlike openness. Yeah, I think that this is a welcome addition to the kind of uh, canon of faith-based films of the past however many years. Yeah. It's solid, you know? Yeah. Solid. Solid stuff. I understand that it's actually playing in some theaters. Right. Uh, not many. In the many. free world. Yeah, not many. But uh, but if there happens to be a theater near you that is open, you might want to check it out. Check out the listings because I, am, I imagine that this is also one of the few films that is actually opening right now. I think that a lot of yeah. major studios are yeah. holding back their movies. Right. So, uh, so it very well may be that this is playing near you. Even if it's not, it's uh, you can watch it at home. So it's released digitally or will have been by the time that this episode is released. The website, the official website for the film is FatimaTheMovie.com. I'm kind of kind of curious about, you know, how many Protestants will end up seeing this movie and, mm. you know, how it will affect them. Uh, it, as you said, it doesn't really hold back too much on the Catholic right. practices. Yeah, so good uh, – worth checking out, I would say. Watch with your family and um, I'm glad, you know, I think we're at a stage where like we've got uh, – we're getting some, some religious films that are solid and I think um, – whether they will be continue watched, you know, fifty years from now, I don't know. But um, but we're getting to like a certain level of craft and like kind of sensibility that like begins to like adequately convey the subject matter in a way that's not like overly schmaltzy. Right. There were a couple of bits earlier early on where they're they're doing some shots in the in nature and stuff that I felt were a little bit overly sentimental. Right. Perhaps you you mentioned the. Uh, Drone, drone shots. shots. Yeah. So this uh, is a pet peeve of mine with with a lot of films coming out these days featuring these drone shots, which used to be much more complicated shots to get. You'd have to get into a helicopter and have your camera man in there. But those always felt so much more uh, deliberate and also human because you still have a, a human behind the camera holding it and able to to move and focus. But uh, these drone shots, you you see them and they're so obvious to me because there's a quick pull away, zoom out into the stratosphere. And it's supposed to look cinematic, but... But it ends up looking kind of um, uh, static um, and robotic. And, uh, you know, this is is an opinion. So there's plenty 
of room for disagreeing with me on this score. But every time I see a drone shot, I just kind of, uh, I feel like that dates, it's going to date films. I, I, yeah, I, I imagine that drone shots are going to be with us for maybe ever now, but I think that over time, filmmakers are going to be able to sort of uh, mask these shots a little bit better than they are now. Fair enough. All right. Well, I think that's that's it for today. Just doing a short first impressions for you. And uh, thanks for listening. Uh, Our Lady of the Rosary, pray for us. And uh, Saints Jacinta and Francisco, pray for pray us. Pray for us. And uh, St. John Paul II, the patron of this podcast. Pray for pray us. Pray for us. Uh, and uh, Lucia, she must be a servant of God or something. So pray for us as well. Uh, so, yeah, thanks for listening and we'll see you next time.